Okay, John, I'm going to fire this party up. Good evening, Idlewild. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we're also streaming live on our Facebook page, so John's going to give us a count as we get into things. But thank you all for coming and being here in person. My name is Mike Fader. I'm president of Mountain Disaster Preparedness. Um, how many folks are relatively new to the mountain? Good, 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 good. Uh, I hate to always preach to the choir about our organization, but see as we've got some newbies, I want to explain to you what we are and what we do. Uh, mountain Disaster Preparedness was formed in 1986 when we all, when the founders realized the threat from earthquake, fire, weather, road closures, um, all the things we face in living in a rather rural community. So MVP was formed um, and through contribution from the community over the last many years, we built a very unique infrastructure uh, to support the community in the event of an emergency. Uh, we've got first responders with Idlewild Fire here. We've got two uh, stations from CAL FIRE. But let's face it, in an emergency, they're going to be stretched, and we are all going to have to take care of ourselves. So that's what MDP was formed for. Um, it's an umbrella organization supporting five main, or four main pillars. And John, can we scroll down? Mm -hmm. um, now I'm talking to you about MVP. You we, through our website and through our Facebook page, consider ourselves a source for official information. Uh, we get our feed from Riverside County Emergency Management Department. We get our feed from Idle Wild Fire. Um, there's a lot of chatter on other social media sites that sometimes is accurate and sometimes it's not. But we pride ourselves on being a source for information coming from the officials. Um, we've got nine disaster aid stations scattered throughout the hill. Uh, two in Pine Cove, one in Mountain Center, and five in Greater Idlewild, running from Fern Valley out toward Idlewild Arcs, one right here at Town Hall. Uh, those disaster aid stations are for our CERT people, CERT meaning community emergency response team members. They will operate out of those disaster aid stations, canvassing the neighborhood around them, uh, estimating damage. We've got a communication network at each of those disaster aid stations that report what our people see on the ground to incident command. Uh, and there they are. It's about $10,000 worth of equipment in each one of those. Uh, there's a generator, and that, there's first aid, and that's where you folks would come if you're injured or if you want to know what's going on. Because we'll have a uh, radio connection from incident command to our our folks at the fire department and then out to the disaster aid station. So it will be a source of accurate information for those that want to stop by the disaster aid stations. Our next group is our medical group. We've got trained both active and uh, retired doctors and nurses that will operate and work out of giving first aid 
out of the disaster aid stations. We've also got a lot of supplies here at Town Hall. Um, and we'll operate this as a criti critical care unit um, for those that are more severely injured and need care, number one, and transport, number two. Um, although the disaster agents have a, disaster aid stations have a pretty good supply of first aid stuff, uh, bandages and things that our medical group believes we would be using in the event of, and then the more severely injured, broken bones, lacerations, things of that nature would be cared for here. And then there is CERT. <coughs> And that's where we need a lot of help. The community has turned over, over during pre-COVID. And uh, we've lost some of our CERT team members. It's the core blood of our volunteer organization. And uh, it requires 20 hours of training. It's offered through the fire department or Riverside County. And CERT basically is teaching you how to care for yourselves and your family, number one, your neighbors and friends, number two, and when that's accomplished, turning to help our community. So it's a, it's a big need for our group, it's a big need for the community, and hopefully, um, you can contact us either through the website or me personally, and we'll let you know when the next training is going to be. We just graduated uh, 25 people last month, um, and we're grateful that we had them on board. But Mountain Disaster Preparedness is here for you. We're going to do our best to help this community during and when we have an event. Uh, we need volunteers in just about every area that I mention. Uh, so if you love this community like some of our, uh, some of us veterans do, uh, we'd love to have your support now. You know. Any questions about us? Yes, hi. Hi. Do you need to have any special skills to join the CERT? No, none. And age is not age is not uh, anything that should hold anybody back either. I think I'm looking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean with age or physical ability. Okay. No, you're trained. Your that twenty hours trains you in first aid and fire suppression and uh, a cadre of skills that everybody should have. Okay, with that, we got a little sprinkle last night, thank goodness, um, and everybody's heard of El Nino, it's all over the news. Uh, we were surprised last year with uh, the amount of snow that we received up here. Weather's a fickle little thing. We Alex can probably tell us that he can forecast seven to ten days out, but beyond that, it's a, it's a guessing game. But we want, Alex has been here for three years now, or four? Three or four, yeah. Yeah, a friend, a friend of Mountain Disaster Preparedness, a friend of mine. And uh, we have him up every year to give us a heads up in terms of what we might be looking for during the winter and how we should during the winter. So with that, Alex Tardy from NOAA San Diego is here to address us. I was just thinking about it when I drove up today. I think last year I came up in September. It was a little bit yeah. earlier for some reason because it was a rainy monsoon day. Yeah. Whereas today is a rainy or was a rainy winter type day uh, from the storm yesterday. So, um, our office is down in Rancho Bernardo, San Diego County, and we cover 
Orange County, San Bernardino County, Riverside County, and of course San Diego County. So we cover a pretty large area in Southern California. We're a 24-7 facility. So very much like Mountain Disaster, we're in it for preparedness, for warning, for action, for mitigation. Uh, we're in it for all of those. Uh, so we send out the alerts when the weather gets really bad. We send out the forecasts um, for any situation. And like Mike said, he's dead on. He must have read, he must have listened to one of my uh, radio podcasts or something. Forecasting beyond 10 days is, is almost impossible, largely because the storms don't exist. You, do you ever get frustrated with Google Maps or, or Apple Maps when it says your trip's an hour and all of a sudden it turns into two? Um, how could that happen? Because it doesn't know if there's going to be a car accident. It doesn't know if there's going to be an immediate road closure or spin out. Uh, it may not even know yet if it's going to rain or snow. Uh, maybe that will come soon. But with weather forecasting, you need to know some things. Uh, and beyond 10 days, you don't really have a storm on the, on the horizon, on the globe, usually. There's some skill, uh, and we'll try to go over some of that. Uh, but largely is a little bit of a guessing game, uh, especially after what we saw last year. So last year we talked about a few things like how extreme it's been, how hot it's been, how dry it's been. We talked about things like that in this room. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about rain, a little bit about snow, uh, but we didn't talk about hurricanes. Um, <laughs> and one of those came in its remnant form called Tropical Storm Hillary. That came up and is still uh, a recovery effort for parts of the Coachella Valley. Highway 38 up to Big Bear is just now opening up. So it's still a slow recovery process with that. And then we certainly did talk about a mega snowstorm in late February, did we? No, we did. I mean, we probably should have, but we didn't. <laughs> uh, and so that snowstorm we're going to talk a little bit about here, a little bit about Hillary. Uh, a lot about El Nino, and then a little bit about long-range prediction as well. I did leave some handouts in the back, so if you want to stretch your legs during the presentation, uh, feel free to get up and get a handout. Um, if you want to send me an email, my email's on there, and Mike has it as well. Mike knows where to find me, uh, either by phone or email. He mentioned the sprinkles. So we did have a few sprinkles uh, yesterday. Um, I mean, maybe a... A light rain but uh, uh, it came out pretty good and you know most of our region and here's your region here about an inch of rain and how do we know that uh, because the people like you people from other agencies have weather stations and they share that information and so we can monitor it in real time we can literally sit there and sometimes I do that admittedly and watch the ticks, watch the rain adding up. Uh, a lot like you might watch the rain in your front yard or out your window. Our weather forecast wasn't too bad. Um, we predicted 0.7 to 1.0 in Idlewild. So we can predict within seven days. That's not what we're arguing about. It's beyond that where it gets really difficult. So it's important for you for mountain preparedness to definitely pay attention uh, in the short term at least uh, for a weather forecast. Now, I think in general, when it comes to uh, a winter coming up or a summer coming up, something like that, we probably all should be preparing all the time, at least doing something, because um, we don't know what's in store all the time. We had lightning. Everyone hear thunder <laughs> yesterday? Uh, so it traveled from Mexico off the uh, Baja coast all the way through San Diego, through Temecula, all the way up to Idlewild eventually, and then it kept going uh, into the high deserts. So it was a situation where um, it wasn't like your normal summer monsoon, where you get those beautiful, and I've seen them here in Idlewild, they're a little bit surreal to me, the, those beautiful towering cumulus going up on an otherwise sunny day, and it's just right over Idlewild. It wasn't like that scenario. It was a, a winter storm scenario that uh, blanketed. So the brown ones are cloud to ground, and then the purple ones are flashes in the sky. Both of them cause thunder, right? 
but uh, one is a little more deadly, uh, the cloud to ground one. So we've had a lot of extremes. Um, I mentioned two of them. Uh, in August of 2023, Hillary, that was extreme. Uh, but believe it or not, just over the hill here, Palm Springs had its hottest summer month of July on record. Wow. It's never recorded July so hot as this past July. And then to add insult to injury, it, the following month, it was the second wettest August ever recorded. And for all intents and purposes, could have been number one because it was devastating flooding in some parts of the Coachella Valley. But it hasn't just been that. Um, last year, we had 13 atmospheric rivers. We'll talk a little bit about those. We had record snowfall in the San Bernardino Mountains, and some of it came over here with about 60 inches of snow. But they had double that. They had 120 inches of snow. Not in a year, but in a week. Uh, so it was very mammoth-like snowfall. And then when you go back in the years, uh, we have a lot of boring weather, like drought, um, that's been plaguing us for a while. So that was the good news. Now, if you look at um, last year's rainfall for Idlewild, and how do we get this? Well, fire station keeps track of it every single day, no matter what, even if it's dry, even if it's an inch of rain, even if it's just a little bit, even if they're on vacation. Somehow they're always reporting it, so we're able to get this data. And we're able to tell you, and I can't say this to most places where I go and give presentations. A lot of places we don't have data. I don't want we do. 45.51 was the grand total of rain and melted snow. Number four all time, your normal is 24. So a normal means like a 30 year average type of, type of average, 30 year average. So you doubled it. You basically had two winners in one, um, but it wasn't your wettest. Some places it wasn't the wettest. Palomar Mountain, which is just down the road, I just drove through it on the back side of the north side. They were number one with 70 inches. So they robbed some of your rain, just a little bit, because uh, they're further south. Snow, flooding, uh, landslides, and then of course, Hillary. That's a day after um, on the 38 when the Santa Ana River decided, you know what, I'm making a new path. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, I'm doing it. And that's what happens when you have nine inches of rain in about 18 hours. Here in Iowa, you know what that feels like. You had seven inches of rain in about that time in February 2019. And 243, 74, <laughs> They pretty much didn't exist in many locations after that rain on Valentine's Day 2019. So it can happen here, it can happen anywhere. This is what it looks like on a map last winter. So these dark blue shaded, you had two winters in one. And it was a lot of places from about Tahoe all the way down to San Diego. Now, like I said, it wasn't record in Southern California, but it was top five in most places. Parts of the Sierra Nevada were the wettest ever, ever recorded. Keep in mind, uh, last year was not an El Nino. Last year was not expected, but boy, did it deliver uh, in a big way. It was also a cold year, um, and not just because we had snow, but the temperatures in general. Uh, a lot of places uh, along the coast, inland, and even parts of the mountains had a really cold season. Uh, you know, so we had months like December, January, they weren't just wet and mild, they were wet and cold, a lot of cold storms. But in the same breath, keep in mind, the summer in Palm Springs and much of the Coachella Valley, July and August, and July being number one all time, had one of its hottest summers on record. So, really cold winter, really hot summer. A lot of extremes mixed in there. If you look at our, our rain year, Last year, our average in Southern California is right around here, okay? And we were about double that. We were about double that. The last time we were so wet um, was either the 2019, or in most cases, you got to go back to 2005. So you got to go back in those 20 years to see it so wet in Southern California. Now, why? Uh, well, it 
what's the, it's the storm track, it's the jet stream. Now, you are unique up here, uh, you know that, but your weather's unique, I mean. So you have clouds and thunderstorms and things that form because you're a mountain. So it's like a magnet. Not quite how it works, but it feels like that. And this was not because of your mountains. This was because of the weather pattern. So the weather pattern set up that it was just relentless. And it was cold. And it was picking on literally our region, central southern California. What I want you to notice, though, the weather pattern last winter, it was a big roller coaster. And it wouldn't move. So we kept getting storm after storm after storm. The prior three years, we were in this big red area. So the, the entire weather pattern just shifted a little bit. Just shifted a little bit. It, it's not supposed to be blue, and it's not supposed to be red. Those, those mean that they are anomalies. Uh, they're unusual, they're extreme. And that's why we've had such extreme drought, because we've been in that red for a while, and last year we happened to be in that blue. The billion dollar question, literally, is how do you know in advance like the weeks and months, that you are going to be in something like that. You can, you can predict a snowstorm, rainstorm, you can predict one six days out, maybe ten days out, like Mike said, but how do you know that you're going to be locked in a pattern like that to, to result in something? So the good news, no one's really complaining about this, I haven't heard anything, maybe someone will complain. The drought got removed. So literally we improved as much as we possibly could uh, the last time we did that was 2017, which was a La Nina, and before that was 1978, where we just, in one year, just said no drought, and just totally, we got too much rain all those years, 78, 2017, and last year, we had too much rain at once, but the good thing is that we got rid of the drought. And I told you I'd talk about atmospheric rivers, so what they are, is a way to transport energy from the tropics. And that's just basically wind and moisture. We know the tropics have a lot of energy. We've seen it, like with hurricanes. But this is not a hurricane. This is a direct transport of wind, wind pushing moisture from the tropics. And you need that jet stream that I showed you earlier to bring it up here. And that's what happened yesterday as well. So, um, we have 13 of them listed up there. You might remember, maybe one of those dates are your favorite, um, or not your favorite, because you had problems that day. But those are the 13 atmospheric rivers that came through, allowing us to have such an incredible year. A lot of years, we might only have three or four, maybe five, if we're lucky. Uh, and the difference with last year is that the entire state of California was repeatedly hit, especially central and Southern California. The different colors just mean the intensity. So um, the, the reds would be stronger than the oranges, for example. So that just means it has more wind with it, more moisture being transported, which results in, in the rain and snow that we get. Uh, just some photos that I took on January 16th. Um, that day uh, in our region, we basically just had seen enough. Uh, and you would think in a flood prone area, when, when you think of preparedness, right? Um, do you typically think of like prone areas or do you think like areas that are vulnerable or do you think of areas that are like not vulnerable, like where they never had a problem in their whole life? Um, I always wonder like what people are thinking, but this is a flood prone area. Fashion battle. Yes. <laughs> and, and there were multiple vehicles, not vehicles parked, vehicles driving in the water and they got overcome by water, stalled, and had to be rescued by lifeguards early in the morning. It was a holiday, Monday, so traffic was lower than average, but it became a complete mess. <clears throat> the snowstorm. Uh, we got to talk about the snowstorm. I know we had a lot of snowstorms, but I'm talking about the snowstorm. <laughs> The uh, late February of 2023, not that far ago. Uh, that's a photo I took up at Running Springs, and I liked it because I couldn't see the gas station. And so I thought that was kind of cool. I could see the gas pumps, but I couldn't see the actual store. 
Uh, this map is showing um, how much snow fell. And you can see from Idlewild down to Mount Laguna in San Diego, it was roughly about 60 inches of snow. But when you got up into the San Bernardino Mountains and you missed the bullet, you, you dodged the bullet, it could have been even worse. Um, they had uh, most areas over 100 inches of snow in five or six days. They had 48 inches in, in one day in Mount Baldy. They had snowfall rates between two to four inches per hour. Um, sometimes I used to think it was fun when I, I grew up uh, in the mountains back east. And I thought it was kind of fun, like when you shovel your walkway and then you go inside and get something to eat and go back out, it looks like you didn't shovel. Um, but it got to the point where I don't think it was fun anymore. Things just shut down. It was blinding snow. Uh, eventually people got stranded, people were locked in their homes, uh, the roads were not plowed, they couldn't plow them, they couldn't find people, they, they used snow cats, snowmobiles, ATVs to get to people. And the whole area was pretty much shut down for two to three weeks. Gradually opened from side to side. Um, the reason why it didn't open in the middle was because the middle had the most snow. So conditions weren't quite as bad in, in Big Bear. They weren't quite as bad in Wrightwood. But when you got in the middle, like Crestline, like Arrowhead, it just was bad, 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 and then worse. So we think it might have been the biggest snowstorm on record in that area. I am working with some of the locals in Lake Arrowhead where they think there's some marks um, on trees, you know, or old trees and posts that, that may talk about some 70s snowstorm. Here is um, some of the photos. These are some of my favorites um, because there's actually a vehicle here. This is in Mount Baldy. Uh, this is Lake Arrowhead. This is Mount Baldy where someone's uh, basically opening their door. <laughs> it's, it's staying put. Uh, and then Lake Arrowhead, too much snow where the docks and even boats uh, uh, flipped over. A car, unknown car there. And then just plain snow banks of people digging out and firefighters helping. The Crestline grocery store that completely collapsed. And then what I thought was one of the craziest things with the snowstorm was there was so much snow, and it wasn't fluffy snow, <laughs> but, but so much snow that the weight, not only did it collapse the grocery store, which was devastating, but it was damaging gas meters. Uh, and the gas meters were bending. Uh, they were uh, re releasing gas, and there were at least a dozen fires, a lot of them at night, when people were probably using gas, or in homes that were vacant. Uh, so firefighters just, they, they couldn't get to them most of the time, and they burned to the ground. So just an incredible amount of snow. You could see it on satellite as well. Um, and you could really see that it wasn't just mountain snow. It wasn't just Big Bear, Running Springs. You know, we're used to snow. It was all the way down to about two to 3,000 feet. Uh, and the snow flakes made it all the way down to the Inland Empire, the 215. So it was really, really cold storm. Um, and widespread, you can, you can see that it spilled even up into the deserts uh, north of Big Bear. Why? Well, the same weather pattern that I talked about for the entire winter was just a little more severe. So the big red block got bigger. The big purple blue low pressure got bigger, more amplified, more severe. And everything again was focused on us. So we had we had the best of everything, right? Or the worst of everything. We had atmospheric river with about as cold as air you can find. In fact, um, I tracked back to see you know other times where snow had been reported in Orange County, and I couldn't find many. But there was one time in uh, in the late '60s where I found it. And so I ran an analysis of how cold the, the storm was in the late 60s as compared to this. It was very close, very close uh, to being the same. So very severe, cold type of situation. I like this photo because this was after everything had kind of dust, so to speak, had started to settle. The roads were starting to open up. So I went up to Mountain High with my son and we went skiing. And I get off the lift 
and I'm like, I don't remember how bald he looked. <laughs> Certainly not in the recent years. Um, for some reason, it looks better than normal. Uh, and and on, on the day I took this picture, the crazy thing was, um, an avalanche forecaster sent me a photo of, not me, I was a little jealous, but like a 22-year-old at the top of the mountain skiing down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. While I'm sitting there, it was like the same day. Because I, I sent this photo to the avalanche forecaster and I said, I, I can't tell with my eyes for sure, but there looks like there's slabs breaking loose, like there. You know, there's got to be avalanches. He's like, oh, there sure, sure there, there were earlier. It's more stable now. And then he sent me the photo of someone uh, skiing down the top, pushing up the hike to get there. Uh, it was a big, big storm. It was the first time we've ever issued a blizzard warning. And I never really thought much of it, you know, like blizzard, snow, winter storm. I'm like, what's the difference? But boy, uh, it really increased the messaging right before the storm. And it's one of those things where um, you, don't, you don't regret issuing it because it turned into literally that, uh, where people were pleading for help up in that. There's a lot of people that live up there. When you look at the population, what's the population of Idaho? 4,200? Some of the towns up there are in the 10,000 to 15,000 range when you go from Wrightwood over Lake Arrowhead, Crestline, Running Springs, and Big Bear, and you add it all up. And so we asked SoCal Edison, um, you know, what is the population up there? And they gave us numbers like there's 80,000 meters wow. throughout the whole San Bernardino range. Because they were getting tons of calls, tons of calls um, about meters leaking, not working. That, that type of thing. What, so, what, what, what defines a blizzard? Like what you have to have before you... Yeah, so um, it's a good question. Um, we didn't even have it like in our manual. Kind of thing. <laughs> we didn't have it in our toolbox. We've heard about it. Usually what defines a blizzard is, you know, East Coast, where it's really windy, uh, blinding wind. You can't even measure the snow. You can't even see the road. Temperatures in the 20s or maybe even colder. You don't even know how much snow is falling because it's snowing like crazy, but it's so windy it's just blowing all over the place. No matter what you do, you can't win against it, and then you shelter in place. So the definitions are, you know, basically 30 mile per hour winds, temperatures below 30, yeah. but heavy, heavy snow with blinding visibility, um, and we we had it all um, in, in the storm. So ended up, you know, we couldn't stop the storm, but it ended up helping with messaging about how severe it could be. Uh, there's been other, uh, you know, snow, siege, uh, Armageddon, snow, snowmageddon, other different type of descriptions that happened. It probably, second to wildfires, it's probably the first time I've seen so many first responders, fire agencies going to whatever. There was, there was thousands of firefighters uh, and volunteers up on the mountain doing that. And I don't like doing that. I mean, I like shoveling snow, but that is like, that, you could get injured, you could die. I mean, that's a lot of weight, that's a lot of work. Uh, you know. So how was the forecast? Well, the forecast was pretty good, but we ran into a problem. Our scale wasn't high enough. <laughs> uh, and we didn't go out far enough in time. So here it is, uh, February, February 20th, okay? And we knew a cold storm was coming, and we're like, eh, yeah, big deal. Just really cold storm, but not a lot of moisture. Uh, and then we said, there's, there's a different one coming at the end of February, but we'll wait until then. So, so this ran out um, from Tuesday all the way to Sunday, but it ended up snowing even longer than that, up until February 28th. But we, we didn't have a big enough scale, um, and so when I looked back and added up all the numbers, the, the highest number we gave uh, was 84 inches. And there was many places that had about 100, to 100, 100, 105, from Mount Baldy all the way over to Running Springs. Now, it wasn't just that area. So this was Snow Valley, and then this was up uh, near Mammoth. It wasn't just Snow Valley, San Bernardino Mountains, Riverside Mountains. The whole state was hit hard as well. In fact, 
It ended up being the snowiest year ever on record for the Sierra Nevada. The snowiest year forever for Mammoth. In fact, Mammoth changed their website after this year. So if you've ever used the Mammoth website, they have a really good history of snow. Um, and that's all it used to be. It used to say like, you know, uh, 1978, 400 inches. And it didn't really break it down. Uh, they changed the website entirely and they started listing different categories, average snowfall, base depth, all these different categories, and they basically broke them all. Uh, they broke them all. So they probably had a volunteer, an intern, or a 20-year-old uh, uh, person that was really sharp with data, and they rebuilt their web page with data. So there's a lot more data on there after this year. 718 inches of snow. And what's even more remarkable, if you look under the hood, their top three records are all La Nina. So I don't know if Mammoth is going to change their advertisement and say, um, La Nina's here, buy your ski pass, and then, and then show this. I mean, why would you not? But when you go to their website, it still says, you know, El Nino's here, buy your website. Uh, you know, buy your ski pass, buy your ticket. But I think that might be their marketing tool they may not have discovered. Okay, so um, the water year last year, when you add up water and snow in, in the Sierra Nevada, was not number one. Uh, but number one is that 2017 year that I mentioned that last time we snapped out of drought in one year. And the big 82-83 El Nino year, it's sandwiched in between last year and 2017. So this is in inches, so this is an average of 65 inches of water. So 65 inches of water melted snow across the entire mountain range. That's how you get out of drought uh, when you have that much water. Now I thought this was interesting, and I'll skip to the mountain areas too. But if you look over the past several years, uh, we've had La Ninas that are really dry. We've had La Ninas that are really wet like this year. Uh, so we've had just a little bit of everything. So a lot some years, a little some years, but then when you look at like the El Ninos, they've kind of behaved the same way. They've been, some of them have been wet, some of them have been dry. Uh, so it just really has been back and forth. And you can look at it even in Idlewild, um, and that number is not updated, that wasn't the final number because you were up around 44. But you can see that you know our years themselves are extremely variable. But take a look at this. Our wettest year is even in Idaho, La Nina, La Nina, El Nino, La Nina. So right now the score is three to one. <laughs> La Nina is winning three to one in the past decade or so. Facts are facts. Like like Mike said, we want to share the facts, not 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 the possible facts. Uh, the closest we could get to the facts. But we're in El Nino now? Or? Yeah, that's what we'll be showing. We're going in El Nino. Um, here's the statewide snowpack. I told you an average of about 66 inches of water, but there were places that were holding 90 to 110 inches of water. That's a lot of water. Um, that's how you get out of drought, and that's how you create floods as well if you don't capture that water. Just incredible amount. Uh, record snowfall, sure, um, and even beat the big El Nino of 82, 83. So we just beat up all the records, uh, not just with snow, but with how much water was stored in that snow. El Nino, 82, 83, you held in first place for how many years ago was 82, 83? 30 something years, you've been in first place, and, and now you are beat. Okay, so your question was, yeah, what are we going into? You're right, we're going into an El Nino. We were stuck in La Nina for several years, okay? And it's very normal to, to go back from La Nina, El Nino. I'll show you what El Nino and La Nina really mean um, in case you're not totally familiar with it. But it's typical, it goes back and forth every few years. The last big one we had was 2015-16. But remember, the wettest year is 2016-17 in most places. The snowiest year 
is here. The last big one where it actually worked out perfect, if you look at perfect as a lot of rain and snow, was 97, 98. So that was years ago. Um, and then there's your 82, 83, way over in the left. So it's very normal to, to have a couple years of La Nina, a couple years of El Nino, to go back and forth. So what the heck is it? Um, so along the equator, they get a lot of sunshine. Uh, the wind doesn't blow much. You probably have seen Tom Hanks' movie, Cast Away. Uh, they have trade winds and they have some daily winds. But it's generally kind of uh, calm and they have a lot of sunshine and a lot of heat and the water is warm. Okay, so there's a lot of energy there. But over time, you get too much. Okay, so just like weather is a way of redistributing cold and warm, wet and dry, that's what El Nino is. It's a way to redistribute water where it gets too warm, then you move it around, you mix it up, you redistribute it, and you cool it off, and then you get to start the cycle over again. So with El Nino, you're getting excessive warm, and where's that warm coming from? It's coming from the western Pacific and moving to the eastern Pacific. When El Nino gets too, too warm, then La Nina takes over and it throws that warm water back over there and the cold water comes up. It's, a, it's just an ongoing, very normal cycle. But when you do that, you change the wind patterns and the pressure patterns. You change high to low pressure, low to high pressure. You change the way the wind blows, okay? And you also change the energy level in there. So you start developing more rain, more thunderstorms, more energy brewing up. Now, before we had satellites or anything like that, all we thought of was the fish. Fishermen were the ones that understood and detected El Nino. So literally, say, say you're a fisherman off the coast of South America. You're out there fishing in September. Wow, I haven't caught one of these for four years. Mm -hmm. You don't think, you know, let's get another one. But then, two years later, you know, you're off there and you're like, where the heck is that fish I caught two years ago, you know? Why are they, there's none here? Who's taking them all? They, they, are, they, are they gone? Because the water temperatures changed. And so they didn't even know exactly what they were discovering, but they were discovering the normal cycle of El Nino, La Nina. Uh, so it's just a way for the ocean to, a big ocean, to redistribute the heat and energy of the water. Um, it's a very normal cycle. But it, it can affect the weather. We'll talk about that. Now, normally, in an El Nino, a warm phase, this is what comes out of the oven, okay? On the left-hand side, temperature. So normally, the southern part of the United States, including Southern California, is much colder than most winters. Uh, it's more like last year, right? It's colder than, than usual. On the right-hand side, normally in an El Nino, from Florida all the way over to Southern California, and sometimes Northern California, it's wetter than normal, a lot like last year. Uh, so this is what it normally looks like. Now, this is what's actually been coming out of the oven. So we've had El Ninos that have been wet, we've had El Ninos that have been dry. We've had La Ninas that have been the driest on record, 2017-18. We've had La Ninas that this year now are the wettest on record. So what's going on? We've gotten uh, things that are coming out of the oven like we once expect. So let's take a look at one El Nino in particular. The Super El Nino of 2015-16. What this is, is the average weather pattern during the year. It looks completely different than what I showed you earlier on from like last year. So that big cold purple thing, that is the, basically the main storm track. The black line is where the storms are traveling. So during the entire winter, El Nino worked, it changed the jet stream, it made it stronger, more, more focused, more powerful. But what it didn't do was steer it into Southern California. It literally steered it into Seattle for weeks, months at a time. And we pretty much missed every storm that year. So in the same breath, you can say that the strongest El Nino on record was one of the driest years for Southern California. And I can show you. Not only did that year not make normal, which is 30 years, 
So here's the El Nino average, way up there, right? Normal there. So this, this is 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 inches average across Southern California. Not only did it not make El Nino average, it didn't even make the normal average. It was way, way down. It was one of the driest years. But in Washington. <laughs> yes. So, so what's going on? You know, the El Nino thing is back and forth. Yeah, some years are wet. You know, you might have better odds in Vegas. Uh, some years are wet, some years are dry. You know, what else is going on? Well, that's what we're starting to look at. And this is one good example. So in December 2021, we were in the midst of a big drought, okay, a couple years ago, COVID and everything, big drought. And going into that year, it was a La Nina. So everyone was in the dumps. They were like, oh man, this is another drought year. I'm tired of hearing this, you know, fire, fire, this and that. Uh, tired of all this, you know, conserve, conserve, conserve. So the December 2021, out of the gates, like a horse race, it started snowing and raining in California, and it just wouldn't stop. It ended up being uh, in Tahoe, the snowiest December ever, and the third snowiest December of any month. So third snowiest month of any entire month. Number one December, but number three any month. We just couldn't shut it off. Starting January 1, well, we got our wish. Not only did it shut off, we have never seen a time where two-thirds of California has been so dry, not for one month, for three, January through March. As if, as if the winter didn't even happen. Um, and, and our neck of the woods, yeah, we're celebrating, right? Um, we basically were in second place. And a fact that's interesting to me is Mount Laguna, they got more snow than here in Idaho, but they got more snow at Mount Laguna than Mammoth during that three month period. So these extremes are not just year to year, they're within the year, making it even harder and harder to predict. So if you go back all the way to the start of the drought, this big roadblock, okay, like the 215 in Riverside, this big roadblock in the Pacific was there. In 2020, it was there. In 2021, it was there. For some reason, last year, it decided, oh, I'll, move our, I'll move a little bit to the left, and floodgates open, we got cold air, snow, and, and we had one of our wettest years on record. Number four in Idaho, right? But what we don't know is why is it so blocked up? Why is it, so, it's kind of like your sink. If you ever probably your sink, you know, where it's like, uh, it's just not draining, you know, the slow depth of your sink and drain. Um, and this blocking has been going on and on and on. So, um, here was the forecast last year uh, that Mike was talking about. So, before the winter, the forecast expectation was, okay, 30% chance of being normal. It's pretty low. 30% chance of being normal. The most likely outcome below normal. Below normal because you got now almost 70% chance of being below normal, 30% chance of just being normal. Uh, so when you look at it, um, the forecast was horrible. It was opposite of what happened because we had two winners in one. And I'll show you how, how crazy it's been. So last year, the blue shaded, remember two winners in one in all the blue purple shaded areas, looks very much like your El Nino year. Your average El Nino year looks very much like last year. Problem was, it wasn't El Nino. So you would get an F if you turn that into your teacher. Okay, if you look at 2015-16, okay, we were the driest location, Southern California, compared to normal, 30 year normal, than anywhere in the United States, except we had a super El Nino. We ended up looking like a La Nina. So you would get an F. <laughs> Even though you're stating the facts and you're showing there was absolutely no relationship between El Nino and La Nina and those two years in the past decade you have proved it. Okay, we are in El Nino. Okay, that's the easy part. I just grabbed this satellite image today just to double check. 
It's like, it's like looking out the window. And, hey, it's going to snow tonight, but shit, it's still sunny. <laughs> you know, um, so all this red means more warmer than it should be. The fishermen down here, fisherwoman, they're out there, woohoo, they're back again this year. You know, they're really happy if they like that type of fish. But the problem is the entire Pacific Ocean has a lot of warm water. A lot of warm water. In fact, between May and September, the global ocean temperatures have never been so warm. So we've never recorded even a one month period like May or June, June, July, July, no matter how you slice and dice it, put them all together, um, number one, never seen so much warmth in the entire ocean. El Nino's not going away, and the computer models say that. They say it's going to continue. So El Nino's out there, the water's warmer than it should be, it's brewing, it's fueling the atmosphere, and so things are, are starting to bubble up. So what does that mean? Will that make our forecast any easier? <laughs> Fortunately, not really. Um, so late November, early December is proving to be a pain in the butt. So after Thanksgiving, we are seeing all kinds of mixed signals. So Thanksgiving is going to be warm and mild. We're going to get Santa Ana winds right before Thanksgiving. It's going to be warm, dry, and mild. But after Thanksgiving, um, we just can't figure it out. There's the potential for another good cold storm like we just had, maybe even better. But the problem is, we don't know if it's going to go into Southern California, or if it's going to go to Salt Lake City, or if it's going to go way up to Montana. We just don't know where it's going to go because the weather pattern is so up and down. Now, um, does it get easier when you look further out, you know, into December? Not really. So every single day, these images are produced. Green means wet, brown means dry. And what we're looking for is basically stormy patterns, where there's a lot of green. Um, one day in late November, December, it shows up as green, like this one. And then the next day, because it's prediction, it shows up as brown, back and forth. Very frustrating to me, relax. The month of December couldn't be a better example. So, a little hard to see because it's low resolution. But you see the blue over California. Okay. Every day it's saying December is going to be super wet, super wet, super wet, super wet. Ah, tricked you. It's going to be dry. Okay, maybe that's just a fluke. Then it goes back. It's going to be wet. I'm just kidding, just kidding. And then today, not only dry, but super dry at the bottom of the scale. It doesn't know. It doesn't know. Just because there's an El Nino, it still doesn't even know the month of December, which is not far away. Now, what about December through February, the real winter, the entire winter? Um, okay, do we have any more confidence? Well, when you average them all together, it says green, which is wetter than normal. So this one here is average to wet, this one's wet, this one's wet, kind of average, but light wet. Wet, wet, average, and then this one is bone dry, NASA's model. Uh, <laughs> And then this international model is kind of a compromise of that one. Now, a month ago when I looked at this, the score was more like 3 to 3, 4 to 4, whatever. Now, at least the wets are winning. This is really what it's coming down to, is just probability and odds type of thing, regardless of the fact if it's El Nino. So what, if, are, the, like, what are the Vegas odds right now? <laughs> <laughs> but that might help. Yeah. If you, if you break it down month to month, okay, you start to feel a little better. So this is a collection of like all the best tools that are available, that money can buy, that computer models can run. December, wet. January, wet. But as if California was a, a, like a bullseye, people were like really good at throwing darts. Wet, wet, and then it breaks away in February, tries to come back in March. So there's better confidence that this could be a big deal this winter, but I wouldn't say high confidence. Now, when you look at temperature, um, which is typically a lot easier to forecast, you can see that there's a, a big warm pocket all winter 
which basically means uh, the northern latitudes much warmer than they should be. So the North Pole, Santa, Santa's area, uh, a milder winter than average. So the official forecast for December through February, which was just issued today, looks a lot like the green that I showed you before, month to month or December through February, where we have more confidence it's going to be wet, but we don't know where, but the entire state of California, potentially. But look at our friends in Florida and the southeast. That is where um, there continues to be really the only confidence where it rained really hard uh, yesterday and expected to be the wettest part. But this is probably the best we could do. Now, to understand this map, and this might disappoint you a little bit, this map says green, right? It feels wet. You know, green means like grass growing or whatever. But let's break down the numbers. That green shade is 40 to 50 percent above normal. But it's not dipole. So it's not 50 50. So 40 to 50 percent above normal. And then you have to take the remaining, which is 50%, cut that in half, and so you have a 25% chance of being drier than normal, 25% chance of being average, 30 year average. What's that in Idaho? I have a 24.4 inches of rain. And then you have a 50% of wet. So it's all just odds. It's all just odds. It's the thing that no one wants to hear. <laughs> they they want to hear yes, no, wet, dry, cold, warm, really bad, really good, uh, you know, type of thing. Tons of snow, tons of rain, uh, that type of thing. But because of the uncertainty and because of the extremes within years recently, um, the predictability that far out is, is um, it's pretty amazing. What technology, what skill, I'm trying to think of it, since 1995 that hasn't improved. Maybe misinformation yeah. is the one that's um, gotten way worse, even though we have more information, it's just that there's more misinformation. Uh, we have tons more information. But there's not many things, you know, in terms of that are technology driven that have gotten worse since like 1998. Long range forecasting has oh, gotten worse. There's climate change too, you gotta throw in there. Yep. And there's the summary. And we can open it up for questions, including uh, climate change. I think climate change is an overall factor in, in terms of the more severity, the more inconsistency, the more exaggerated, the more extreme. And I'm talking cold, warm, wet, dry. All sides of the spectrum. Uh, 20, winter 2021 22 was a perfect example. No one is ever going to be able to predict that the snowiest month on record in Tahoe is December 2021, and the next three months, it's never going to snow again. <laughs> you'd, you'd, you'd lose your job. You wouldn't be working in the snow in the that. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. Question in the back, yeah. If you uh, describe the temperature chart, and typically gave them a nice chart, and it's needed. This right. one? Yeah, the right side. Yeah, so everything's compared to long-term averages of 30 years. So what this is saying here is in Southern California, there's about a 40% chance of being warmer. But again, 40% and then you've got 60 left over. To be fair, statistically, the 60 has to be divided by 2. So you have a 40% chance of, of warmer conditions overall. A now 30% chance of normal type of thing, and then a 30% chance of colder. So you actually have a 30% chance of being colder than normal. Isn't that crazy? Even though it's in orange, designed to get your attention that's going to be mild or warmer. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, we have tried to do uh, yes, no, well, like 50-50 flip of a coin, so that so that um, normal is not a factor. You're, you're either drier, or wetter, or colder, warmer. Yeah. It's one or the other. Yeah, it's like a light switch. We've tried to do it that way as well. 
then your skill level goes down. <laughs> so if you look at like the Pacific Northwest, you can see it's about 60 to 70 percent, okay? Uh, right around 60 percent. So that means the chance of it being cold is much, much slimmer. It's really about odds, betting, if it's within seven days, it's more about precision, accuracy, and you should expect more for sure. Beyond seven days, especially ten days, there's a famous scientist, and, and he's generally been right, this is like from the, from the 1800s, that there's a chaos theory that beyond eight or, I think he said six days at the time, so he's not totally right, that's a long time ago. He had some type of equation that suggested that beyond six days, it was impossible to mathematically predict weather anywhere in the world. Beyond six days. Uh, and he showed it mathematically. It's not totally right, but it's not far off either. Yeah. Final. Chaos theory. Yeah. Um, do you know anything about the weather modification program of the San Antonio A little bit. Cloud City, we're not involved. Um, Colorado has set the bar, so Colorado has uh, flown aircraft and, and, and used base, ground-based instruments to inject um, uh, silver iodine and, and, and elements like that where it attracts all rain clouds and snowflakes have a nucleus. Usually it's pollution, volcanic ash, um, dust. Uh, any, any, any tiny thing that you and I can't see with our eye, that's what a raindrop or a snowflake grows on. So the theory is if they inject more of something similar to that, you maximize the rain. So you, 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 you steal the most water vapor. You don't create more water vapor. You steal the most water vapor. It's like squeezing the sponge extra hard in getting out. So in Colorado, they've proven maybe 15% maybe uh, more rain, more snow. I was just wondering if yeah. they, like if we end up getting a ridiculous amount of moisture on the mountain, if all that turns spring goes off mountain. <laughs> yeah, the, the one thing about the cloud seeding and the modification is it doesn't do you any good on, 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 a, on a sunny day like next week. You have to have a storm. You have to have a jet stream. You have to have something coming in that is lifting the atmosphere. Otherwise the stuff will just come down and just be a waste. I, I so, so you, like, you can it's make like, some. Like the mountains getting a good amount of water. Yeah. Let's not do it this year. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how much they're doing it. I'm not really privy or involved in that. I just know that Colorado has spent the most money on it, had the most success. <coughs> Their studies show that they've basically improved the efficiency of, of an average winter storm by about fifteen percent. <laughs> yeah, California hasn't been involved with it that much. And also keep in mind, you've got to do it downstream. So if your storm's coming that way over the ocean, you've got to get it into the storm so that the storm can lift it and, and the process can evolve into precipitation. Otherwise, you're feeding the data, right? If, if it goes too far to the east. That's true. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm inferring something from this or not correctly. Um, El Nina and La Nina is always been about equatorial temperatures and whether it's hot or cold. Correct. But at this point, the northern Pacific is warmer than it's ever been. So all the models were based on a cooler northern Pacific. Is that what's throwing all of the... Like historically, it was, you know, this is what happens with based on the northern Pacific being at certain temperatures. But now it's not. We think... Um, so we think that... So the tropics and, and the northern latitudes, let's go back to the photo. The tropics and the northern latitudes don't release energy the same way. So um, when you see uh, this region, that's like bathtub. Up in this region, even though it's much, much warmer than it should be, it's not bathtub. It's much cooler water. So you don't have the same response and same release of energy. So in other words, uh, at about 20 to 30 north in latitude, there's not a lot of indication that the ocean's feeding the atmosphere. It's more the other way around. 
the atmosphere is feeding the ocean. So, no, so what I mean is, the, those big, the big block in the Pacific, that anomaly is allowing more sunshine, less wind. It's like your pool heating up in the summer with a high sun angle. So the ocean is warming and not being able to consistently cool because there's less mixing and, and more stagnation. Um, so it's, it's not feeding, it's not generating tropical storms. Or right, it's not the, yeah, yeah. But when the tropical storms go west across the equator and come back up around, and hit that atmospheric river, it's going over much more of the water than it. Yeah, correct. Right. So if you have if you have a storm and then you bring in uh, extra moisture and energy from like El Nino or the tropics, and you have a storm coming across the Pacific in our normal jet stream pattern, uh, and then you bring that over like all this warm water here, um, you are it will fill up. You are inducing even more energy. Uh, into the system itself. Um, it, it's hard to measure it exactly, but... So my, my question is, is, does that render all of the historical data kind of moot? Because you don't have the same historical situation with cooler systems. Something maybe, um, you definitely start messing up some of the equations, so you get more um, uh, sensible, which means like uh, touching type of heat, and more latent which means the, the, the heat that's given off from generating precipitation, um, you get more latent heat release in it. But um, I, I don't think we know yet um, how much the entire warming of the Pacific is messing up with either the equations or even the general process. The, the, the short-term solution has been disproven that, oh, okay, the Pacific's really warm, so now there's a big ridge, because that's warm, and so now the storms are going all to the north, so that's why we're not getting them. I mean, last year, I completely disproved that. So all it takes is a little shift back and forth. Um, but this area here, uh, we thought was like the root of all our problems in terms of figuring out energy, but there might be independent processes going on, especially with the heat content of the entire Pacific. And it's not just the Pacific, it's the Atlantic too. I just clipped it, it's not showing it. So I don't know if it's as simple as, as it's messing up the modeling, but I, I do know part of what you're saying is correct because a lot of the long-term predictions was more an analog, which was heavily focused on what does typically happen with, when you have this condition? What's, what's, most, what's the most likely scenario? And that was wet and, and cool was the most likely scenario. So, so the analog process has definitely broken down um, where you're almost right for the wrong reasons sometimes. So like in 2015-16, a really dry year, you know, what went wrong? Everyone's got a theory. And then last year, 2022, 20, 23, what went wrong? Why was it so wet? Everyone has a theory. Um, but it's not as simple as... As I think in the early 2000s, it was like, El Nino, El Nino, La Nino will predict everything. We will certainly what will happen because of this. It was so hard. Um, not meaning less, um, uh, small meaning. Yeah, small significance. Be, and, and largely because of the extreme behavior, like within even within one season at a time, um, or storms themselves, but within one season at a time, we're, we're still seeing it affect the jet stream. But that jet stream is not pointed at us consistently like we once thought it was. In other words, Seattle can have an extremely wet year from the same influence as El Nino as we could. And that was not, that was not what was sold in the late 90s. It was the opposite. Yeah. Job security. <laughs> yeah, question. Yeah, Alex, so, you know, if we watch the news and listen to things like this, our impression is that whether events are becoming more extreme of all types. Is, is that actually any truth to that? And if so, uh, why might that be? There's definitely truth to it, but we've had extreme weather since recording 
has begun. Um, we can measure it like, um, where do I have the, is it after here? We can measure it right there. We can measure it like locally, like in Iowa, Southern California, or we can measure it globally. So the general theory is the more warming you have, the more energy you have, the more warming you have, the more moisture you can hold in that environment. So you can measure that in the ocean as um, uh, they do with hurricanes, tropical cyclone uh, energy content. And you can measure it a lot of different ways like that. Um, I think what you're seeing on the news is the after fact where it's being measured based on maybe the cost of the damage, the severity of the damage, and not, not necessarily just the storms. Mm -hmm. Are the low pressures getting deeper? Are the high pressures getting higher? Certainly the temperatures are getting higher. Certainly the dry and wet events are getting more exaggerated. But it probably needs to be more a measurement like this, the atmospheric <coughs> ocean. Uh, in, in terms of just the individual events of wet, dry, cold, warm. So um, we do it by season, we do it by storm, but I mean the overall amount of energy that is available and being, being released, which ultimately ends up in the, the flooding events. The, the, um, the one thing we're seeing that's becoming a little more clear is the bottleneck of the whole atmosphere where, where instead of just moving along and then resetting, moving along and resetting each year, each season, sun angle gets high, sun angle gets low, everything resets, it, where we're, we're having more, um, uh, more patterns that are kind of stuck. We, we call it amplified, blocked, you know, in meteorology. But those inherently in yourself, the more you have the roadblocks inherently, just like the traffic, the more severity you have of really good conditions and really bad conditions. Mm -hmm. So in effect, we could, what we kind of are seeing maybe is wildfires are getting larger and worse, and winter storms sometimes also being larger and worse. So in this given year, you can have extreme heat and extreme cold, all having human impacts. Absolutely, absolutely, and cold is an important one because even though the cold is shrinking, it's becoming more severe when it gets displaced yeah. by those amplified, by, by warm, <laughs> lack of a better term, by the warm pushing it aside. Um, but then you have consequences when the warm gets too big, like this, where then you're, you're going to have less cold because you're losing ice and you're losing other type of factors. It's, it's like a negative and positive feedback. You know, drought can make itself worse because it releases less water vapor. Then the temperature gets hotter, and then your humidity goes down, and, it, and you kind of spiral out of control until you can break that cycle type of thing. But uh, I think, you know, instead of just focusing on like billion dollar disasters or major floods or major heat waves, major cold snaps, just like that, that, that maybe um, a more regional, state, local, and global view of, 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 of what's happening, like something like this, um, might be a little more objective. Um, because it does seem like you know, everyone's backyard is having something Severe, and that's not necessarily the case, but the entire global structure is feeling that warmth, you know, is feeling that extra energy type of thing, yeah. And, and what gets really frustrating is, is that implies that predictability is less, but it's not less in the short term, like within 10 days. It's actually gotten way, way, way better. Um, so then you get the information kind of crossed up. Like, why am I going to believe that forecast and do anything about it, you know, type of thing. Uh, can't get El Nino right, how can they get that one right? Yeah. So is there a sense of, this is my question, is there a sense of like a, a boomerang effect in the sense that 
we had this really cold, really snowy winter, and then Palm Desert gets the hottest summer of record, yet it was the coldest, snowiest winter, <laughs> and then the hottest. I mean, I, I mean <laughs> it's, a, it's a great research paper that you probably would get a solid A minus on. <laughs> Maybe an A plus, the teacher would be like, the atmospheric science teacher would be like, scratch his beard. You know, kids got a point. That's a pretty good scenario. That's pretty good. It's not going to happen, but it's a pretty good scenario. Yeah, um, <clears throat> we, we've got to do a better job keeping track of the severities to answer his question. Is it really more severe? Is it really more anomalous? Uh, and, and, and then trying to match that up with the trends that are a little easier to monitor, like global warming, global ocean warming, land warming, ice melt, you know, to see if, uh, El Nino, tropics, and all, and all that, and see if, to see if, um, I don't think we quite know, short of just saying that there's more energy and more warmth is, is resulting in a more extreme behavior in, in, in like these, these high impact type of events. But people are definitely trying, um, you know, uh, Scripps in La Jolla is probably one of the leading groups and they are extremely frustrated with the predictability, with El Nino, La Nina, the predictability from year to year, the predictability within the year um, for like reservoir management and that type of thing, extremely frustrating. Um, and they've been given money, but they're not coming up with any uh, answer. And, and it might be because, like you were saying, the analogs and the initial equations didn't account for those variables. They just didn't. We were maybe lucky. We were lucky and at the same time the planet warmed. So at that time we were maybe really lucky and maybe if we had had another 10 at bats we might have missed a few, like we have recently. But we only have a small sample size, right? Very small sample size since like the 50s. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of lot of work, a lot of work to do. But the great news is that, like Mike said, the short-term weather forecast is good. What effect does the warming in the Pacific have on the jet, if any? Yeah. So um, most of the research that has shown. Um, it does change the pressure patterns at the surface, just like El Nino does. So um, it's been shown that the warmer the water gets in the northern Pacific, the less the subtropical high pressure near the surface. And the whole, the whole circulation that gives us like the northern, northern cold current along the California coast gives uh, Bodega Bay the strong winds. That whole high pressure circulation um, gets displaced further north, like closer to the cold air. Because uh, in order to get really high pressure where we live at ground level, you need cold air, you need dense air. Uh, in order to get really low pressure, you need warm air, you need lower pressure, you need less density. So um, it's been shown at the surface to have a pretty significant effect on the low level wind patterns but very little on, like what you said, the jet stream upper level patterns. Now in the tropics, uh, it's been shown, and we can track it through the tropics, it's been shown that these energy couplets leave the tropics and, and they can propagate all the way up into the Pacific jet stream and affect it. And that, that was the whole El Nino theory. And um, that hasn't been shown or proven yet for, but maybe we haven't had enough time to figure out what all that extra warm water can actually do to a jet stream. Yeah. But right now, it's indicating it doesn't have much influence north of about 30 north latitude. Great questions. Yeah. 
Okay, so when uh, last year we got 70 something inches of snow, I forget what actually total out like 74 or something. But at the time they were like, this is the most snow in 59, 60 years. And I looked at that history, and back in the 50s and 60s, we got 60 to 70 yep. inches three or four times a decade. Yep. Like that 50 to 60 inch thing was kind of normal. Mm -hmm. It just ceased being normal after the 70s, let's say. Yeah, I mean, that's like, well, is there any chance we'll go back to 50 <laughs> <laughs> Uh, every couple of year basis? Because we've been at 20 years. Why is your It's a fair question. We, you know, certainly there's a chance, and, and, if, and if last winter is a signal, you know, yeah, if if you're in the crosshairs of it, you, you could go back to that normal scene. But it, it seems like we only talk about like the extreme peaks, right? Like you talk about 2017. Or 17, 18, right? And in that decade, we had one peak. Right. But if you go back 50 years, we had three or four like that every decade. Not just one. Decade. Right. Right. Um, I mean, maybe, 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 there's, maybe there's truth to people when they, when they say when I was younger, you know, the snow was way up here. <laughs> you know, and, and, okay, so let's go back to 50s and 60s. I know it's super hard to see, but it's right there. That's all over the place. And, and we were just waffling, cool, warm, cool, warm, <laughs> which is basically average, cool, warm, cool, warm. And the, the columns have just been stacking up, so. Too, too much? That's not six to 10 days. That's <laughs> No, it's not. <laughs> Right, and that, and that, and, and, and of course, this is compared to an average. I think what they use here is a century average, but traditionally, it's a 30-year average, updated every 10 years, type of thing. We don't typically just use a century average because um, it would be really depressing. <laughs> We'd be breaking records with warm temperatures on a very routine basis. We'd have very few cold temperature records, but um, there, there's definitely a swing, um, in, not in everything, but in warmth and, and snow. I mean, snow is a direct equivalent of warmth, right? You want more energy to get more snow, but then inherently your snow level's higher. More of your storm's water, and then drought's the whole other problem too, because then it doesn't even matter, right? Because like in our drought years, we don't even get rain, which makes your numbers super low. But I think that's the basic theory, though, about the uh, about the normals changing. In the Southwest United States, the normals have changed the most in terms of drier. <laughs> Uh, and in terms of warmer. Yeah. There's only a small portion of the country that has actually gotten cooler on normals, on averages, when you, when you run your calculator and everything. And that's like in the um, like South Dakota, Nebraska, a small corridor there, where, where decade after decade, it's actually gotten slightly cooler. Um, and there's parts of the country that are getting wetter. We're not one of them. <laughs> yeah. I remember 20 something years ago, we had a thing up here called the Idaho Speaker Series. And someone came up to talk about weather forecasting and climate change. This is, it's good to be pretty good for the But what they said was look, it's, all weather is going to get more extreme. And Idaho may have ended it because it may actually get wetter up here, while everything surrounding Idaho will probably get a little bit drier. Because you'll get more storms, bigger storms. And you may benefit in terms of a little bit more water than that's than historic. That's still like the climate change 101, where uh, you have longer dry periods, you have uh, less frequent storms, but when you do get one, like 2019, they are bigger, seemingly bigger than ever, uh, more impact. That's still today what like the long range models show, uh, with heat waves too. 
uh, more frequent heat waves, more intense heat waves, um, but like with precipitation, less frequent. But when you get them, wetter. And that really plays havoc with your averages, right? Because your averages don't really reflect what, what really you need to prepare for. 30 years ago, though, that's pretty good. So, was it someone from Scripps or something? I don't know. I wish I could remember who it actually was. Yeah. But, it could have been. They might even still be working. It was one of those, like, some of those locally was organizing it. We had random speakers from all sorts of yeah. different they things. Might have, they might have driven up. I, yeah. I mean, it could have been us, our agency, but yeah. based on the way you phrase it, it would have been, doesn't ring a bell. It's been 20 years. Okay. I don't think 30. I think 20. Yeah. And in our mountain regions, too, because more energy means more wind, means more ma moisture transport. So you guys are already a magnet, if you will, uh, where, where perpendicular, that just results in a more extreme event when you get it. Yeah. Like a tropical system when you get it. And the great thing or worst thing about a tropical system, we didn't talk about it much, but it's, it's coming from the opposite side. So now you have the side of the mountains and the deserts that aren't used to your weather. And you just have tremendous, you have more impact, more runoff. So the wettest side of the storm is actually way over there rather than here. Because the flow is 180 degrees different, I think. And we did, we did get questions about tropical cyclone, um, in case you're wondering, you know, is that something we have to start preparing for now, like regularly? The short answer is no. Um, and even from scripts, uh, they're not willing to say that sea surface temperatures will support anything. What's so amazing that we didn't show it, the whole separate talk, but what drove Hillary here was not that the water was warm, was not that she felt like coming here, was not that Idlewild is a magnet, even though you are. Um, this massive heat wave that was going on in Iowa and Missouri where they were over 105 every day in the Corn Belt. Uh, they had dew point temperatures, which was measured in moisture in the 80s. Uh, instruments were breaking, they were breaking temperature records. Um, that massive heat wave took in control of two thirds of the United States and created the whole circulation to actually pick up the hitchhiker Hillary and bring her up here. Before that, Fernando and Greg were equally as big, equally as vicious, hurricanes, and they came nowhere close to coming up here because the flow, the normal flow, didn't support it. So the abnormal flow, like an extreme heat wave, a big dome in the Midwest, uh, allowed it. A lot of times people think, that, oh, it's the warm water on the coast. Oh, it's, uh, it's because the land is really hot. It sucked her in. You know, no. Uh, but in this case, you know, the, the global pattern changed, which, which allowed it. Driven by heat, but awesome. Great questions. You want to love this guy? Yeah. yeah. See why he comes up every year? I want to get him on the road because he's got a two hour ride going home. But I want to thank Alex. You've been a friend.